A few weeks ago, you may have seen Sierra Space release a full-scale burst test video. It was a big bang. This video had over 1.3 million views and over 1,600 comments, most of which were related to the design and testing of our life habitat. Today, we're excited to talk through and answer some of our favorites and share perspectives on why this technology is so cutting edge. <laughs> I'm Sean Buckley, Senior Director of Engineering at Sierra Space. And I'm Beth Licavoli, Soft Goods Certification Lead Engineer. And let's get into it. Gotta ask, do you guys consider the possibility that tiny space debris could puncture the hull, or is there a protection system in place that helps this inflatable hab defend itself against them? <laughs> you been thinking is about there? that one? I don't know. Maybe we'll grab this. Yeah, we'll this. just do exactly like what we did on the burst test, which is just the restraint layer and the bladder. Right, so what you're seeing in the testing that you see in our burst test is basically this. You see this thin layer? This is what you see in the burst test. Mm -hmm. This is everything else it takes to make the soft goods system. That's the entire architecture is everything else from this plate up to the outermost. So all of these foam layers that you see here, um, and there are layers in between that we refer to as our decimation layers. And so we have analyzed this. We've done a lot of testing and a lot of analysis to run these models and verify that space debris, you know, uh, particles will not impact and puncture our restraint layer. And in doing so, how you test that is you, at the component level, shoot a really fast projectile um, at it at, that's at space speeds, and then you verify that it doesn't puncture. And how these layers work together, there's a series of layers, and the outermost, which is the top in this case, um, hits, and then the projectile is broken up and slowed down. And then as it goes through each layer, it's caught and broken up and slowed down again, until by the bottom, there's nothing left that's gonna hit. So we test all of this, we put it into the entire architecture, and that entire stack is what's comprised of our MRMOD shield, and we're in these tests, all we're testing is this bottom layer. So there's a lot more material, a this lot guy. more testing that goes into this. Um, this is just one of those layers and one of the keys to that. Interesting take on living in space. I just hope it's not gonna leave plastic in space too. Think of the space turtles. <laughs> <laughs> what are the turtles gonna do, Sean? I don't know what space turtles are. <laughs> I mean, all right, maybe there's something we're missing. Hey, let's take a note. All we right, need we'll, we'll drop that one down. Space yeah. turtles. Space turtles. Let's save the environment <laughs> in space. In, space. <laughs> in all seriousness, no. Uh, these burst tests, they are really what allow us to have confidence that this thing will not burst in space. The module won't rupture. We have a lot of confidence in that. It's pretty safe to say, we will not damage any turtles in space. What is the life expectancy? How will the rupture point change over time as this thing wear out? Um, all right, so as this thing wears out, pretty interesting. What is the life expectancy? So the burst tests give us data points. You wanna do a series of bursts. So to define this, we take the operating pressure, which is 15.2, we times it by four, which is a safety factor which is induced or given to us by NASA as a recommendation. And that safety factor gives us 60.8. What we wanna do is exceed that in every test we do for soft goods on the pressure shell. Once we exceed that and we get a data point, we do what's called a creep test. That creep test gives us a longer mythic curve that tells us how long it's gonna sustain in life. Right now, we're looking for a 60 years life expectancy or more. I think we might have that beat a oh, little bit. Oh, yeah. What's our current numbers looking uh, like? Like two and a half million, I think. Two and a half million at years. At our operating pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so, so we've done a whole bunch of component level testing. So we've tested each of those individual webbings, the, the one inch and two inch webbings for longer durations than we set up a systematic creep test because those are, have a lot more logistics to it. So we're able to set up these, these strap level and test those for quite a bit longer. And that data extrapolates and you can correlate that to the systematic creep test. And that gives you that long duration that proves that at our operating pressure, 15.2 PSI, we're into the millions, millions of, of years. years. Guess what? A bicycle tire has more than 110 PSI. <laughs> <laughs> Sure does. <laughs> How However, do you want to answer at, that one? <laughs> at the volume that we're working on, it's the pressure is a relationship to the volume, and given that our volume is incredibly large at this life full scale module, the pressure is significantly lower. You'll note that at our subscale test, we have burst pressures around 210. You know, in that family, 240 was our most recent one. However, this one, the full scale, when you went up in volume, your pressure went way down. That's just physics, that's just like <laughs> the nature of the beast. <laughs> how it goes. Man, that thing ruptures in a fascinating way. 
It makes me think about the difference between hoop stress and axial stress. What's interesting is that your cylinder is so short that the two are similar. It's fascinating to me that it ruptured in the axial direction. Hoop normally fails first. There's an interesting analysis waiting to happen here. My guess is that my orientation is off because your geometry is so interesting. Yes. <laughs> in those videos, it's hard to tell exactly where and how the rupture started. Uh, and so I can understand the confusion and thinking that it was an axial strap failure initially. However, we were able to go through that high speed video, go frame by frame, pause it in the exact location at the exact frame where the rupture began. And we're able to see hoop strap, uh, one of the hoop straps begin to move and slide. And that was an indicator that that was what failed first. However, you're spot on that the, right after that, one of those axial straps fails, which is definitely related to our basket weave architecture of that restraint layer. You know, that's why you test. You never really know what's gonna happen. Yeah. So uh, yeah, some incredible uh, phenomena happen with that basket weave architecture uh, with the hoop straps and the axial and our overall size and scale of the module. Um, but awesome. yeah, great awesome question. Work. I told my wife's stepbrother's cousin about this and he wants to volunteer to be inside during a rupture test. How does he go and sign up for this? He says he can handle up to 100 PSI. <laughs> That's pretty good. You must really have some family drama to, to work through there. How does the temperature insulation work in that inflatable module though? Since the layers are so thin, how will astronauts stay warm and how does the pressure inside the module stay the same? Everybody goes up with jackets, right? Yeah. Big, big, big parkas. puffy parkas. <laughs> in our outermost layer of the soft goods, what we refer to as the multi-layer insulation, that is comprised of many, many layers of aluminized mylar, Dacron netting, many layers of that, and that's really what keeps the life module inside insulated. In addition to the stack of MMOD, all those materials really compound and collectively provide protection against those aggressive temperatures in outer space. How is radiation handled? I'm assuming that it's harder than micrometeorites, which likely requires layers, but do layers here match or surpass the usual radiation protection means? Great question. So yeah, we're talking about, there's a series of layers that comprise our life module. From the innermost, there's the air barrier, the restraint layer, which is what we were testing on these burst tests. There's the MMOD shield, which protects against those micrometeoroids, and then the multi-layer insulation, which is the outermost few layers. This insulation, while it looks thin, it's comprised of many, many layers of mylars and netting. It gives the spacing and protects against and insulates. And then the radiation particularly is comprised, it's handled through numerous of these layers, all compiled together. So radiation and the humans inside are a key focus for us and how we stack and assemble these layers and what materials we select for each layer is a key in doing that. This is freaking rad. Uh, yes, it yes, is freaking rad. <laughs> Very cool. Um, blanking plate must be talking about an off radius hard zone that plays nice with soft goods. Congrats team. Uh, yeah, it's freaking rad. Uh, the yep. reason it's so rad is you're taking a hard structure and you're putting it into soft goods. And what better place to place a hard structure in the soft goods and give you a window to view Earth, to view the moon, to view whatever orbit you're gonna be in. We see it as a challenge, but obviously we did a fantastic job in the challenge at full scale and subscale. So that's just one of the freaking rad things that we're gonna mm -hmm. do um, here at Sierra Space. We're gonna do a lot more cool things over the next two years. Uh, and you're gonna see some really just yeah. I mean, you want to talk about rad? You got we got some things coming out the door that people have no idea are coming their yeah. way. Working the, the blanking plate is just the beginning on those sorts of things. Yeah. How does the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man feel about all this? <laughs> <laughs> we think it's more more Michelin Man, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. Uh, he's on our side. I, I mean, think we, so. we have a consultant agreement with him, so I mean, it's really important. <laughs> we <laughs> <laughs> to inflatability and beyond. Yeah, that's just an amazing statement, and it's what we live every single day. Uh, we're designing these soft good systems, habitats, but we also are designing the interior systems, right? The ECLA systems, and every, every other system it takes to go reach beyond and to go into space. Um, we take this really seriously. This is something that the team has really been focused on, and we see this as the next generation of habitats. What is that inflatable and beyond? We see it going to deep space. We see an inflatable going around Mars. We see inflatables that can take four, six, eight, 12, 16 people into space to give that experience and go explore those new opportunities. 
you know, go boldly where we haven't gone before. Mm -hmm. I think beyond for us is, yeah, what were we doing now? Working on, you know, the next test in the, in the nearest term, but then, you know, out into the future, ensuring that what we're doing now builds that foundation and we go forward and we have great success going, going on into the future. I see no limits to what we can do with our inflatable technology. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty amazing to see what Sierra Space is going to do over the next decade.